Hey, microbiology students. Welcome to chapter 8, Microbial Metabolism. There's going to be an awful lot of chemistry in this chapter, but what I will try to do is to point out in each of the reactions what the cell gains from this. Why is the cell doing it? What chemicals are going into a particular pathway and what is coming out of a particular pathway. We're going to follow the carbon molecules, we're going to follow the energy molecules, and we're going to follow molecules called reduced coenzymes. And if we can keep track of those three categories of molecules, then it helps us to make a little more sense out of all the big giant pathways that we're going to see. There are always certain categories we can put our reactions into. Metabolism is the sum of all the catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is where bonds are broken. And we take large molecules and break them down into smaller molecules. When we do that, we release energy. And anabolism is we take those small molecules, stick them together in various ways, and build larger molecules that requires energy input. And so I remember catabolism has the same prefix as catastrophe, where things fall apart. So catabolism or catabolic reactions break things down, and we release energy that Energy can be used in anabolic reactions, anabolism, energy input from our catabolism to build molecules we need in our cells. And dehydration synthesis that we saw in our macromolecule chapter is anabolism because we're building bonds. So we can't just spontaneously throw two glucose molecules in a test tube together and expect them to build a maltose. We would have to provide energy for that to happen. The cycle of energy, one of the energy molecules we will keep track of is ATP. That stands for adenosine triphosphate. There's the three phosphates. Those have a lot of energy. When those bonds are broken, it releases a lot of energy, and that energy can be used in our anabolic reactions. The rest of that molecule, there is a five carbon sugar and a double ringed molecule called adenine. All energy originates in our universe from the sun. We could also take in chemical energy we are going to do a process called phosphorylation. That means adding a phosphate functional group onto something. In this case, we have adenosine diphosphate and a phosphate. We put those together through phosphorylation to have three phosphates, ATP, when we break a phosphate off to have energy to do anabolism is dephosphorylation, removing a phosphate from a molecule. Phosphates can be added or removed from molecules other than ADP and ATP, but this is just showing the cycle of those molecules. Our cells have a pool of adenosine diphosphate and phosphates, and we have a pool of ATP, and the direction in which those balance is depending on the state of metabolism in those cells. Here is our ADP and phosphate doing phosphorylation to create the energy molecule ATP. When we break off a phosphate, that is exergonic, and we release energy. When we look at our exothermic or exergonic energy releasing reactions, we're going to use glucose as our model input. Pretty much 
all of the mole all of the organisms that we're going to study can use glucose. They might have to use it in different ways, but they are capable of using glucose. It is a simple sugar. We are going to look at several stages of metabolism, including glycolysis. We look at the components of that. The first part, glyco means sugar. Lysis means to break, so we're going to be breaking sugar. And there's our sugar that's going to break. The Krebs cycle, you may have learned it as the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle in your general bio class. And that's going to continue breaking down the carbon that's left over. And lastly, oxidative phosphorylation. Phosphorylation means we're adding a phosphate. Oxidative means we're going to go through oxidation reactions to release energy. And after we take our original glucose through all of these steps, we're going to release ATP energy, and we're going to create six carbon dioxides, six waters, and some heat. That energy released as ATP can be taken by other organisms and take the glucose, link them together to form polysaccharides. And that's just one example. We could take amino acids, bond formation, and build proteins. We could take glycerols and fatty acids and make triglycerides. We could take nucleotides and build nucleic acids. All of our reactions are also going to have something called the activation energy. It's a barrier to chemical reactions. Even though we might have the right reactants in the right place, if they don't get placed into the right positions and in the right proportions, they are not going to react. So when we write out our full equation later on for cellular respiration, we're going to write it as if we have glucose and oxygen together and boom, we create carbon dioxide and water. And that's not exactly what happens. In order to overcome that barrier, we can have a catalyst. In biological systems, the catalyst, which is a substance that helps to lower the activation energy, those catalysts will be enzymes. And enzymes are a surface. They are not a reactant and they're not a product. And they are unchanged at the end of that reaction. So having enzymes will make sure that our reactants get into position to create the products. So a substrate is also called the reactant. What is going in to a reaction? The enzyme is the surface and the specific region on that surface where the reaction takes place is called the active site. And once that substrate binds to the active site, we actually cause a temporary change in the shape so that it binds tightly together. In step three, there is a literally physical force by the enzyme on the substrate to cause a physical change. The products are released and the shape of the active site is returned exactly to how it started. It's called the induced fit model because we get a temporary conformational change, a temporary shape change. But the enzyme gets used over and over again. Depending on the reaction, this could be dozens to thousands of times per second. There can be coenzymes required. So the gray shape is the enzyme. The coenzyme, oh, excuse me, has to bind to create the true active site. Without both the enzyme and the cofactor, the substrate won't fit. Now, we don't need all of our enzymes to work all of the time. We have to control reactions happening when we need them and have them not happening when we don't need them. And so that process of shutting down or turning off an enzyme is called inhibition. 
The two primary ways to do that are by competitive inhibition, where something sort of fits into the active site and competes with it so that the substrate cannot bind. There may be other open spots on that enzyme, but that's not where the substrate binds. The competitor competes for the active site. It's sitting there and the substrate can't bind. This enzyme isn't permanently damaged. It's just temporarily occupied. If we had some competitive inhibitor that permanently bound, then we would be destroying this enzyme. We have natural competitive inhibitors that fall into and out of our active sites as the uh, correct way to regulate <clears throat> when a substrate does or does not bind. Non-competitive inhibition is not competing for the active site, but it ruins it. It binds in the allosteric site, which means the other place, not the active site, but when that inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, it causes a conformational change in the active site so that the substrate cannot bind. So when an allosteric inhibitor reduces enzyme activity, we could also have an allosteric activator. So an inhibitor binds to the allosteric site and the enzyme does not work. An activator means the normal state of the enzyme is that the active site is not available. When the activator binds, now the active site is available. And many of our pathways are regulated by allosteric inhibitors. It's called feedback inhibition because the end product feeds back to the first enzyme in the pathway to block that active site. So the regular pathway would be the substrate binds into its active site. We go through several conversions and the final product indicates to the cell that we have created enough of this final product. We no longer need to function the rest of these enzymes. This is a very brief and cut down model of glycolysis. It's also called the emden meyerhoff parnas pathway. I've only ever learned it as glycolysis. It is the sugar breaking stage, our initial preparation for getting this molecule into the metabolic pathway. The little black balls represent carbons. Glucose is a six carbon sugar, so there are six carbons shown here. The glucose is going into the pathway. We have to invest some energy so that the bonds are available for the continued process. So two ATP molecules are going to go in. Two ADPs come out because one phosphate is taken off of each of these we have remaining the adenosine diphosphates. We create fructose diphosphate, meaning there's two phosphates on the fructose. That undergoes a process to create two of these molecules called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. There's where the phosphates went. They were two phosphates on this fructose. One of them went to this glyceraldehyde. One of them went to that one. It's called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate because the phosphate is on the third carbon. You are not going to have to memorize this pathway. These images will be embedded in the exam and you will have them to refer to. And this chapter 8 will be on exam 2. This material will not be on exam one. Each of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates undergo the exact same process. We're going to put into the process this molecule NAD. NAD is a coenzyme. 
stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It is an electron acceptor. It is positively charged, so when these molecules get broken down, electrons are released. There are also protons released, and so that is the equivalent of a hydrogen atom. So the NAD plus captures electrons and protons as hydrogens, and it comes out as NADH. That happens on both sides. And then we're going to have to put in two ADPs and two phosphates on both sides. From this one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we generate two ATPs. From this one, we do the same. This is called the energy payoff phase because we generate ATP. The carbon exits glycolysis as the three carbon molecule called pyruvate or pyruvic acid. Those are interchangeable. So we put one glucose in. We put in two ATP and we get out two ATP here and 2 ATP there. So we generate 4 ATP, but we're only ahead energetically by 2 because we had to spend 2 to get started. The other energy molecules we have are these reduced coenzymes. They are holding on to hydrogens that we are going to use later in another pathway. We haven't finished. We've gotten through glycolysis and we've converted our glucose into pyruvate. The pyruvates need to continue this process. That ATP that we made in the last step is done by a process called substrate level phosphorylation. We know what phosphorylation is. We're going to add a phosphate. Substrate level. It is happening at the level of a substrate. So we have some substrate containing a phosphate and an enzyme will pop the phosphate off of this substrate and put it onto ADP to create the ATP. And that's how we end up with that final three carbon product of pyruvate and we generate the ATP. The next stage of our process of cellular respiration is called the Krebs cycle. And what didn't show up here is we had pyruvate and now suddenly we have acetyl-CoA. Let's see if I can draw this for you. If we had I'm trying to draw on a trackpad. So I think I'm doing all right here. Pyru. Eight. Give you a chance to catch up. In this process of going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we are going to have another NAD plus going to an NADH. And we are also going to be releasing one carbon dioxide, CO2. The pyruvate had three carbons. One of them is released as carbon dioxide. The other two are released as acetyl-CoA, which means we got to put one more thing in here. We have to put 
in coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is what it sounds like. It acts along with the enzyme. So we have the two carbons remaining from the pyruvate because one was lost as carbon dioxide. So there's the two remaining carbons. And then the coenzyme attaches onto that. It immediately comes off when it hits the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Put the seeds around that. The coenzyme A makes those two carbons more reactive. These carbons enter into this cycle, and we'll see some detail of the molecules on the next slide, and undergoes a series of reactions to continue to break it down into carbon dioxide, to create a little bit of ATP energy, and to create some coenzymes. So we have three places where the NAD plus will catch electrons and protons and make NADH. We have one place where a different coenzyme called flavin adenine dinucleotide captures two hydrogens. We're going to convert the two carbons that were part of acetyl-CoA into two individual carbon dioxide molecules, and we have one step where we have ATP made, and it does say ADP or GDP, that's adenine dinucleotide phosphate, this is guanine dinucleotide phosphate. Energetically, they are the same, this has an adenine ring structure, this has a guanine ring structure, same amount of energy. So we've taken our carbon that was originally glucose, we pulled off some hydrogens and stuck them onto NAD to make NADH in glycolysis. Then converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we pulled off some more hydrogens and stuck them onto NADH. And then when we put that into the Krebs cycle, we pulled off all of the remaining hydrogens so that all we have is carbon and oxygen. This carbon was originally part of glucose, and glucose has carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. By the time we finish this cycle, all of the hydrogens have been pulled off, and that removal of hydrogens is called oxidation. I know, it doesn't make any sense, <sighs> because oxidation is defined chemically as the loss of electrons or of hydrogen atoms. It's called oxidation because it was discovered when iron oxidizes. We get iron oxide. It doesn't have to involve oxygen at all, it just, when they discovered it, it happened to have oxygen. Removal of electrons is oxidation. A very wise student taught me change my pen color black back to something more easy to read is this nice little mnemonic device of oil rig remember I'm drawing on a trackpad so I'm really I have much better hand writing than this this is gonna be fun because I have to write out oxidation Oxidation. I look like I'm letting my three-year-old great-niece write for me. Oxidation is... I'm not going to write for me. All right. Loss. And the R stands for reduction. You I 
own in. I'm glad the last two words are short. Is gain. And we're talking in biological reactions the loss or the gain of hydrogen atoms. So when we go from NAD plus to NADH, that is a reduction reaction. Again, ugh, it does not make sense. It got bigger, it gained a hydrogen. Yes, but we reduced the charge. It was ne it did have a positive charge. We added electrons. We reduced the charge. Reduction is the gain of hydrogens. And I don't really see loss of hydrogens somewhere in here until I look at that carbon dioxide, right? This is where we lost the hydrogens that were originally on glucose. I may have to go back and edit these slides with typing so it doesn't look like an axe murderer wrote them. Glucose is C6H12O6, and that means 12 hydrogens had to go somewhere. Well, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's half of them. We had 2 pyruvates, which means we had 2 acetyl-CoA's, which means we double everything. That accounts for all of our hydrogens. So the process of getting from glucose through pyruvate all the way down to carbon dioxide is the oxidation of glucose. We completely oxidize it. We remove all of the hydrogens. In the process, we reduce coenzymes, NAD to NADH and FAD to FADH2. Here is a bigger picture of the Krebs cycle where our acetyl coenzyme A is coming in here. Here are the actual three places where NAD gets reduced to NADH. The carbon dioxide is actually released in two separate places. There's our energy molecule. And it is a cycle because we dedicate all of these reactions not only to generating energy and in to oxidizing our carbons, but we regenerate this starting molecule to be ready to receive the next acetyl coenzyme A and chug the cycle again. This slide not only demonstrates that it is a true cycle, but also that lots of organisms use intermediates. Those intermediates can be used for various anionic reactions, such as citrate can be used if combined with other molecules to build fatty acids and sterols. The alpha ketoglutarate can be converted into amino acids. The glutamate itself can be converted into nucleotides. Succinyl-CoA can be converted into heme, which is the center of our hemoglobin, and in plants into chlorophyll. And the oxaloacetate, that regenerated molecule, can also be converted into amino acids or nucleotides. And again, you would not have to memorize this image. All of these pathway images are going to be embedded in the exam for you to refer to for exam two. <laughs> the final stage where we get the big energy payoff with our uh, reduced coenzymes is at the very final stage where we're going to have 
protons, that's what these hydrogen ions are called, are going to flow through an enzyme called ATP synthase, and that will generate our ATP. This process is called oxidative phosphorylation because we're going to use the energy generated from those oxidation reactions to drive phosphorylation. The name of this enzyme tells you what it does. ACE, because it's an enzyme. Synthase, it's an enzyme that helps us to synthesize, and the thing we're synthesizing is ATP. There's an electron transport where each complex of proteins in the membranes wants electrons more than the one before it, and so the first uh, molecule, NADH or FADH2, gives away its hydrogens. So NADH gets oxidized when it releases a hydrogen. FADH2 gets oxidized when it gives away its hydrogens. The next carrier in that chain receives the hydrogens, so it gets reduced. In turn, it turns to its neighbor. This molecule gets oxidized and it reduces its neighbor. That keeps getting passed along and eventually there are some extra hydrogen ions that end up outside the membrane. We have an excess amount of hydrogens on this side compared to the cytoplasm because they are charged. They cannot flow through by diffusion. They need this enzyme. This actually causes a physical rotation of mechanical energy. That mechanical energy physically pushes the phosphate onto ADP, and we create that energy molecule. This is a summary of what we've gone through. Change my pen color to highlight some things. Oh, let's do that. So we have glycolysis, where we take the glucose, which has six carbons, and we convert that to two pyruvates, which should each be three carbons. This is why you should have somebody else preview the slides that come from the book, because two times three is six. We produce two NADH, and we have our net ATP is only two. So we have generated two NADH and two ATP from glycolysis. We have to take these pyruvates through what was called the transition getting from the pyruvates to the 2-acetyl-CoENzyme A and 2 carbon dioxide. So 2 times 3 is 6 carbons. Each acetyl-CoENzyme A has 2 carbons, so 2 times 2 is 4, and 2 more here, 5, 6. Still have 6 carbons. The conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoENzyme A produces 2 NADH, it does not produce any ATP. We take the acetyl coenzyme A into the Krebs cycle. For the carbon flow, we convert those to four carbon dioxides. If you go back to the Krebs cycle, when we crank through it once, we create two carbon dioxides, but that's for one acetyl CoA. The second acetyl-CoA goes through and creates two more carbon dioxides. That's why there's four. So there is two carbons that were originally part of glucose. Here's four more. That's all six. The Krebs cycle creates, after two turns, six NADH, two FADH2, two ATP. And so when we start out with glucose to carbon dioxide, our complete oxidation 
we have 10. I did not change 1098H. I wanted to change the pen color to something better. Erase the pen. Now I'll have to do it over, which will give you a chance to catch up. All right, our NADH, our ATP. No ATP. And when we finish, we have 10 NADH, 2 FADH2. 4 ATP, and this column is telling us how many ATP we get from oxidative phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation happens during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. There's two, there's two, we get four. Oxidative phosphorylation doesn't actually happen during this stage. This is where we had our ATP synthase. I'm drawing and nothing's moving. There we go. A S E. 2 NADH. Let's get my pen color back to that one. Make 6 ATP. 2 NADH from here give us our 6 ATP and then our 6 NADH and our I am drawing and nothing's moving there we go 2 FADH2 we have to do a little math change my pen color again let's get it to something not so shocking oh how about just a regular blue. Do our math. 1 N A D H. Will yield 3 ATP. and 1 FADH2 gives us 2. So we had 2 NADH from glycolysis, 2 from transition, 6 from Krebs, there's our 10 NADH. We only made the FADH2 in the Krebs cycle, so they're there. 10 NADH times 3 is 30 ATP. 2 NADH times 2 is 4. That's where we're getting the 34 ATP. I'll go back and be able to type it in there to make it a little more oops, understandable. So the energy, the ATP that we want as chemical energy to do work on our cells, most of that comes from oxidative phosphorylation, the movement of those hydrogen ions through ATP synthase. We only get 4 ATP from the direct substrate level phosphorylation. All of that is happening in the presence of oxygen. Glucose had to be in the presence of oxygen to do glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to be seeing very quickly with our unknowns in lab 
that there are many of them that can survive in the absence of oxygen. The labs on Tuesday, we saw that we can put the unknowns in thioglycolate broth because the oxygen has been boiled out and we have the thioglycolate that binds any free oxygen to water and so there's no oxygen in the media. If your organism can grow in that, then it can survive without oxygen, but then it's not doing that oxidative phosphorylation. It's doing fermentation. And we put the plates in an anaerobe jar. And if your unknown survives in that anaerobe jar, it's almost certainly doing fermentation. This is showing alcoholic fermentation. And what's key about this is that there is no oxygen. If you have oxygen present, the organisms are going to do the glycolysis all the way through the ATP synthase. That creates a lot of energy. It's very efficient. But if there's no oxygen, the options are die, or do a very inefficient form of metabolism called fermentation. We do start with glycolysis. The glycolysis produces the pyruvic acid, which is also called pyruvate. The pyruvate gets converted to carbon dioxide and acetaldehyde. The acetaldehyde undergoes a conversion to ethanol, which is the alcohol that's in beer and wine and spirits. That conversion from acetaldehyde to ethanol is a reduction. I only know that because we also have our reduced coenzyme got oxidized. It lost a hydrogen. So this, oh, that does not look like an arrow. It's supposed to be an arrow. Oxidized. And this hydrogen has to go somewhere. So the acid aldehyde, oh boy, gets reduced. Pyruvic acid came from glycolysis. Each pyruvic acid gets converted into carbon dioxide and acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde gets reduced to ethanol. That hydrogen comes from the reduced coenzyme to create the ethanol. This is important for producing alcoholic beverages. It's also why baking bread smells so good, burning ethanol. But the cells that are doing this don't want carbon dioxide, acetaldehyde, or ethanol. Ethanol is toxic to the cells that do this, just like it's toxic if we ingest it in enough uh, volume. The purpose of doing this for the cell is the NAD+. We need this. We'll go back to glycolysis. We need the NAD plus to catch electrons and protons, the hydrogens, getting removed during glycolysis. This is a test strip. There are multiple wells in that. There are chemical reagents in each of those wells. And then a broth culture of a in this case, gram-negative bacteria, 
are added to each of those wells, and depending on the colors that they turn, this combination of colors will identify the positive or negative reaction for each of these slots and identify what type of organism you've got. We are doing this a different way in lab. We have mm, more than 15 separate tests that we're going to run to be able to identify. The reason is that these are, says, identifying strains of gram-negative bacteria outside the Enterobacteriaceae. So therefore, only a very limited number of gram-negative microbes. Our list of unknowns contains both gram-negatives and gram-positives. Some of them are members of the Enterobacteriaceae family, so this test strip wouldn't be very useful. And this is also uh, used in clinical strains for organisms that do cause uh, diseases. So you can do all of these tests in 24 hours and get all of the test results back. This is just a summary of the carbon cycle. Right? We recycle the carbon. Plants and other photosynthesizers take in the carbon dioxide, do photosynthesis to create those organic matters that we can use through cellular respiration and our off gases are carbon dioxide and water. In nitrogen, the atmosphere has more nitrogen gas than oxygen gas in it, but it's not very useful to us, and so there are organisms that can fix that nitrogen into ammonia and nitrates that can be then used by other organisms. And I will go back and do some typing so that those scribbled notes are a little more clear. I'm also posting some worksheets for metabolism that help you see what to focus on and how to organize the what goes in and what goes out for each of those pathways.